the stars, we wonder indeed what they are. Within our view each night, yet seemingly forever beyond our grasp. As recently as the last century, we assumed that because the stars are so distant, we could never truly know anything about them beyond their silent twinkling in the night sky. Not what they are, how large, nor even how far away. Astronomy is different from all of the other sciences because astronomy is entirely observational. The chemist can go into his laboratory and experiment on his chemicals. The physicist can build an apparatus and change it and test it. But the astronomer can't go out among the stars and kick a star to see what happens. We can only gather information by looking. Any information we have about distances to objects in the universe uh, are built on a firm foundation of knowing how close the nearest stars are. Uh, any of astronomy, to do any kind of astronomy at all, you have to do intercomparisons of objects, and the only meaningful way you can do that is if you know how far away they are. The furthest star is so far away that we can't even see that it's spherical in size. It could be cubical, or it could be a pyramid, or it could have advertising written on the side. All stars look like unresolvable specks of light. So little to go on. Tiny points of light at unimaginable distances. Yet, by learning to precisely measure these heavenly glimmers, we've unlocked the secret of how stars work. The ancient Greeks were the first to note the precise locations of stars in the night sky. While they could only wonder about the distances to this panoply of lights, today we carry on this tradition in the field of astrometry. In the simplest terms, astrometry is the measurement of the position of stars. It may be planets, it could be the sun, but it's the measurement of the positions of stellar uh, celestial objects. And it's important because objects move, and from the movement of objects we can determine many things. One of the most important would be the parallax of stars. Well, and the way I like to explain it is, uh, and to illustrate the effect is, uh, is just do the simple sort of thing of holding your thumb up in front of your face. If you, if you do that and you look at your thumb and you blink your eyes, one eye and then the other one, your thumb appears to jump back and forth compared to the background. If you do that with your thumb very close to your face, it'll jump back and forth over a large arc. If you do it when your thumb is farther away, blink your eyes again, it'll jump back and forth, but not with as, uh, as large a jump. That's the effect we're looking at in trying to measure parallax. Now can you use this to measure distances of stars? It would be nice to pluck your eyes out and stick them millions of miles apart, and then if a finger was very, very far away indeed, you could still see the shift back and forth. But we don't do that, but what we do is take a picture of a section of the sky, say in June, and take a picture of that same section of the sky in December and compare the positions of stars. Once a star's parallax is determined, its distance from the Earth can be calculated using principles of triangulation. For example, surveyors who can't get across the river would lay out a baseline on one side of a river and from one end of the baseline sight a point on the other side and then on the, from the other end, cite the same point, and the angles between them, they could then use trigonometry to solve the distance across the river. It's sort of equivalent to blinking one eye and then the other eye, and then the star that we're interested in that's nearby, sort of like your thumb, will jump back and forth compared to the distant background. The bigger the motion, the nearer the star, and we can then calculate its uh, distance. The determination of stellar parallax is almost as old as organized astronomy itself. It dates from Greek times. If indeed the Earth moved around the Sun as many like Aristarchus speculated, then the stars should show parallax. But no parallax was found. On measuring parallaxes, it's easy to point out why the early astronomers could not measure the parallax even to the nearest star. The angle of the parallax of the nearest star is less than a second of arc. Parallaxes are measured in, uh, in angular units as arc seconds. And uh, one arc second actually is a terribly tiny uh, uh, angle. As an example, if you think of, uh, of a dime, 
you hold up a dime or have a friend hold up a dime and then walk off about two miles away from you. Then when you look at that dime, you're, you're looking at an angle of about one arc second. So one dime at about two miles is an arc second. There are no parallaxes that are that large. The nearest one, uh, Proxima Centauri, is about three quarters of an arc second, and everything else is smaller. Stellar parallaxes were finally found when astronomical technique had become refined enough to measure very, very precisely the uh, positions of stars. And in fact, in the uh, early 19th century, in the, in the 1830s, uh, three techniques independently were brought to bear uh, to determine parallaxes of three different stars by three different astronomers. They measured by standard clock and eye techniques. Laborious, hard going work. Probably 20 parallaxes were known up until the 1900s when astronomers introduced uh, photographic plates and measurements. Then with the introduction of photographic measurements, we could measure smaller displacements and therefore many more parallaxes. In this century, astronomers have continued their observations with ever more sophisticated technology. This, nine, eight, Sept, six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un. We have a beautiful shot of the Viking engines. In the late 1980s, the European Space Agency launched its Hipparchos satellite to make the most precise stellar measurements to date, far above the Earth's turbulent atmosphere. Over a period of several years, Hipparchos gathered data on the positions, distances, and velocities of more than 100,000 stars. Other researchers are now building upon Hipparchos' data. We have a st another study that we're doing with the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is an attempt to tie one particular data set to another particular data set. And the one data set is the wonderful astrometry being done by the Hipparchos satellite. Now the problem is they need to nail that reference system down. And the only way you can do that is by relating the stars, all these stars that they're studying are stars in our galaxy, and we live in a rotating galaxy. So there's some motion of the, of the entire sky in a sense. Hubble Space Telescope's use in astrometry uh, works this way. The telescope has three fine guidance sensors. Two of these fine guidance sensors are used to hold the telescope in place. If we, when we move Hubble Space Telescope around from target to target, in order to keep it locked on a target, we use two stars. So while we hold the telescope with two of these fine guidance sensors, the third is able to walk through a certain field of view measuring positions of stars. So we'll measure stars that Hipparchos has measured, and we'll measure quasi-stellar objects at the same time, and we'll link those two systems together. And basically, it puts a break on the rotation of this wonderful reference frame that, uh, that Hipparchos is coming up with. Measuring the distances to stars continues as one of astrometry's key tasks. Through astrometry, we now realize that even the nearest stars are several hundred thousand times farther than the sun. This revelation was a vital link in our understanding of these celestial specks of light. Under the canopy of the evening sky, the heavens present an expansive array of lights, each differing in intensity. From faint glimmer to radiant glow, these differences in brightness held our next clue to understanding the stars. This range in brightness was so obvious to everybody throughout history that even in ancient times, the Greeks, as they began to use the first star catalogs, felt that they wanted to include in the catalog not only the name of the star and its location in the sky, but also some kind of an indication of the star's brightness. And so a Greek astronomer named Hipparchus came up with the first brightness scale, which we call the magnitude system today. These magnitudes that Hipparchus set up were obviously visual magnitudes. They're magnitudes as we see them with the eye. Now, of course, when we got telescopes, we could see stars fainter. In fact, that was one of Galileo's 
uh, proofs that the universe was larger than we thought it was. He could see fainter and fainter stars. The original scale is no longer useful. And at the same time, they didn't want to abandon it. I know that many modern astronomy students would have been happier if they had just dropped it and started with something more sensible from scratch. And so 150 years ago, astronomers decided simply to modify the ancient scale and otherwise continue to use it today. In order to modify it and make it truly numerical, they had to decide what exactly does a magnitude mean. It turned out that one magnitude had to correspond to a factor of about two and a half times in brightness. A first magnitude star would be two and a half times brighter than a second. A second is two and a half times brighter than a third, a third two and a half times brighter than a fourth, and so on. Not only does this allow us to express fractions of a magnitude now, we could say a star is 1.76 magnitude, if, if that's what it is, but we can also extend the range or the scale beyond the original range of one to six. Even after astronomers modified the ancient magnitude scale, it could still only tell us how bright a star appeared to be. What we really wanted to know was the true brightness of a star, or its luminosity. Unfortunately, there's no way to measure the luminosity of a star directly. When you aim a telescope at a star, no matter how precise the instrument is that measures the brightness, all you can measure is the light which actually reaches you. Now, to uh, fairly compare stars, the energy that stars give off, their magnitude, uh, we have to put them all at the same distance. So again, we need to know a little bit about the distances to stars. Fortunately, there's kind of a loophole here that astronomers can take advantage of, and that's the fact that light behaves in a very simple as well as a very predictable manner. If you move twice as far away from a star, it becomes four times fainter looking. Two squared is four, you square the distance. And so because light behaves predictably like this, if you were to measure the apparent brightness of a star, which is what apparent magnitude expresses, and if you were also as a separate step to somehow determine the distance to the star using, for example, the parallax technique, then it would be possible, knowing how light behaves, to actually calculate how luminous the star must be. In other words, how much, how much energy is that star generating every second in order to appear as bright as it does at that particular distance? When astronomers made these measurements or calculations for the first time, they were really surprised by how much of a range there was even in the true brightness of stars, in their luminosities. They were expecting that stars were all very similar and that their different appearance in the sky was simply a result of them being at different distances. Uh, distances certainly have a lot to do with it, but even luminosity varies over a surprisingly large range we have measured, detected stars that are as much as a million times more luminous than the sun. That's their actual energy output now. That means that they are producing a million times more energy every second than our sun is. And there are also some stars that we've found that are, are as much as 10,000 times less luminous than the sun, producing 10,000 times less energy every second. And this is a fact that we have to accept. That is, any theory that we put forth to explain how stars work has to be able to account for this tremendous range in energy output. By comparing such properties as distance and luminosity, we had for the first time clear scientific evidence that the sun is just a very close star. But we had yet to learn why there were such great differences between these distant suns. Since stars are suns, we know they must be intensely hot. Measuring just how hot the surface of a star is was our next step in understanding how stars work. When astronomers first started taking spectra of stars, they spread the light out into the rainbow and they noticed a certain pattern of dark lines in the spectra. They didn't know what the lines meant. They didn't know why they varied from one star to another. The reason for the difference in the appearance is almost entirely due to differences in temperature that in very hot stars, we will see a certain set of lines. Helium happens to be one. In cool stars, we will see a different set of lines. The temperatures of stars can be determined quite exactly by seeing how bright stars are in different colors, uh, different wavelengths. So, for example, I could put a filter in front of my telescope, which allowed me to observe only the blue light, and then another one that allowed me to observe only the yellow light and a third that allowed me to observe only the red light. And just by intercomparing those three colors, I would be able to, quite, in a quite straightforward way, determine the star's temperature. 
it's clear then that the colors have something to do with temperature. And there's a very nice little example of that. If we watch a, a filament of a light bulb warm up, if we turn the light on with a rheostat very gradually, very gradually, we see the filament come on as a red filament. That's because it's relatively cool. And as we put more energy through that filament and get it hotter and hotter, as it heats up, it gets sort of yellow, then it gets blue. So we can see immediately that the color of a star is a measure of its temperature. Most of the common stars that we see have temperatures in the range of maybe a few thousand degrees to up to 50,000 degrees, although we know the range of temperatures of stars is much larger than that. Uh, but typical st a star like the sun has a temperature of about 6,000 degrees. So the range is from a few thousand to a few tens of thousand for stars that you and I are familiar with. There are very uh, peculiar or faint stars that may be much cooler and stars that are much hotter, but they're rare. Near the beginning of this century, a couple of astronomers named Hertzsprung and Russell began to compare stars and their characteristics. They created a type of diagram, which we call the Hertzsprung-Russell, or simply the HR diagram in their honor today. The HR diagram stands for its two independent co-discoverers, the Hertzsprung and the Russell diagrams, which only came together as the HR diagram in the 1930s. Basically, they took advantage of the fact that by that point in history, astronomers had measured surface temperatures and luminosities for a great number of stars in the sky. So they felt it was about time that we compared those two characteristics to see if, in fact, there is any kind of a relationship, if the temperature of a star has anything at all to do with how luminous that star happens to be. Einar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell were trying to appreciate ways to describe how stars varied in their physical characteristics of brightness, spectrum, color, and used these graphical relationships to express their ideas. And so in this diagram, in which temperature and luminosity are compared, temperature is explained or described horizontally. That is, the farther a star is to the left on the diagram, the hotter and bluer the star is, and the farther the star is to the right on the diagram, the cooler and redder it is. Uh, one of the ways that we have to determine the surface temperature of a star is by studying its spectrum and determining its spectral class. And so many of these diagrams have those famous seven letters, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, which indicate the temperatures ultimately of the stars going from hot to cold. In addition, the luminosity or intrinsic brightness of the star was expressed vertically on this diagram with the brightest stars at the top and the faintest stars at the bottom. So every star at any given moment in its life has a particular temperature, particular luminosity that can be measured. And so every star up there has a particular location on this diagram if we were to choose to plot it on this diagram. This is not a plot of a star's position in the sky, rather it's a plot of its characteristics at that particular moment in its life. Astronomers discovered that about 90% of observable stars fell along the diagonal line known as the main sequence. For these stars, it could be clearly seen. The hotter they are, the brighter they are. There were, however, some stars that appeared at first to be an exception. There were some stars in the upper right part of the diagram, which managed to be extremely bright despite the fact that they were cool and reddish in temperature. Off the main sequence, astronomers discovered that these were giant and supergiant stars. Cool stars made bright by their tremendous size, they also discovered white dwarfs, intensely hot yet faint because of their tiny size. Closer yet to understanding stars, the HR diagram showed us that a star's temperature and luminosity are directly related. However, it could not in itself explain why. To solve the final mystery of why stars vary so much in brightness and temperature, we needed to actually measure their diameters and masses. For that, we looked to binary stars. Just before the discovery of parallax, astronomers studying pairs of stars, stars that appeared to be close to each other, 
just by chance, found that one star was moving around its bright neighbor star. The astronomers realized immediately, this was William Herschel, realized immediately that this was a manifestation of uh, Isaac Newton's laws of motion, that the second star was tumbling around the first, just as the Earth falls around the sun. And once we can determine where the center of mass is and what the distance is to that center of mass, we can determine all the orbital parameters and the masses of those stars. It turns out that if you have two stars going around each other, and you know how far apart they are, and you can measure how fast they're moving, basically how long it takes to complete one orbit, well, the faster the stars are moving at any given distance, the more gravity there has to be in order to keep them in orbit, to keep them from flying off into space. But the more gravity there is, the more mass there must be as well. Well, the first binary stars are visual ones in which you, uh, a person looked through a telescope and saw two stars there. And if they happen to be relatively close to the solar system and they were patient enough, then from year to year they saw the, the positions of these two stars change. And uh, eventually if they uh, watched them, uh, then they could detect that the periods are 10 years or 100 years or something like that. We can measure how long it takes to complete one orbit. We can compare that to the law of gravity and calculate the masses involved as long as we understand that it's the total mass, the mass of the two stars combined, that we're actually measuring here. If we want to go one step further and decide how much mass goes with one star and how much goes with the other, we have to remember that the two stars are orbiting around a common center of mass. That's the point that stays still while the two stars go around it. And that center of mass is proportionately closer to the more massive star. If one star is three times more massive than the other, the center of mass is three times closer to it. Very often the two stars will be so far away that through a large telescope they look like a single spot of light. But if you look at the spectrum, you'll see that the absorption lines in the spectrum move back and forth. If you uh, measure their wavelength on one night, it will not be the same as the wavelength on the, another night. What causes that is the Doppler shift. As one star rotates around another, it'll alternately be coming towards you or moving away from you. When it comes towards you, the spectrum is shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum, and when it moves away from you, the spectrum is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum so that you see a regular change in the wavelengths of the spectral lines, and that's the key to the presence of a binary star. Among the uh, binary stars in the sky are stars where the plane of their orbit is in the same plane as our line of sight, so that one star passes in front of the other. These are called eclipsing binary stars. We have, let's say, a large star and a small star. We can imagine that the light of the two stars comes along constant, then there's a little eclipse, and then it goes along constant, then there's a big eclipse, and then there's a, and this goes on periodically. The very fact that an eclipse is occurring means that we, we know we're looking at it from the side. We know the inclination. We know that the, the Doppler motion is exactly the same as the real motion. In that case, only in that case, we can determine the actual masses involved. But eclipsing binaries told us more than just the masses of the two stars. They also told us their actual sizes. Now, with our spectrograph, we can determine how fast a star is moving, so we know in any units like miles per second or kilometers per second, uh, how fast the star is moving in its orbit. As a star eclipses the other one, we see the light from both of them, and then suddenly there's a dip in light as one covers up the other one. And uh, there's a diminished amount of light until uh, this eclipse passes, and then uh, we go back to the original amount of light. The width of the eclipse, the time it takes uh, for the eclipse to occur, multiplied by the speed, will tell us the, the dimensions involved, the, the uh, diameter of the star. Once we began to measure the masses and diameters of stars using various types of binary star systems, uh, we began to become aware of the range of possible values for these characteristics of stars. Uh, for mass, for example, stars have been seen as low as one-tenth the mass of the sun, and there are other stars which are perhaps 50 times more massive than the Sun. Diameters turned out to have an even bigger range. We know of some stars a thousand times larger than the Sun, the so-called giant stars. 
If you put one of these where the sun is, it would engulf all the planets out to Saturn, swallowing up most of the solar system. And then there are some stars which are as little as 100 times smaller than the sun in diameter. This is about the size of the Earth. After measuring the uh, masses of stars, naturally one wants to play around to see if there's any correlation with some other parameter that goes with the stars. And so it's natural to plot the masses of stars, let's say against their color, against their brightness. And astronomers noticed that if they plotted the mass of star against its brightness, there was a almost linear relation. And this holds for stars that we call main sequence stars, the ordinary run of stars. The mass-luminosity relation is, is really the key to understanding how stars work. If you understand how that works, then stars are very simple beasts. Um, the mass-luminosity relation is an observational fact. We observe that massive stars, stars that contain a lot of matter, produce a lot of energy, and we say they're luminous. We observe that stars that have little mass have low luminosity. So there's a relationship between the mass of a star and its luminosity. That's an observational fact. So at last, the calculations and observations converged on this single relationship. The more massive a star is, the more brightly it shines. In attempting to explain this most fundamental relationship, we would build all future understanding of how stars work, why some outshine others, and how they're born, live, and eventually die.